Amen, amen. Just singing about standing and make you sit. That just didn't sound right, does it? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I am so glad that you're here. It is no fun to preach when you're not here. <laughs> Kathy's the only one, me. <laughs> Turn to the book of Jude. We're continuing there in our message on this series on the book of Jude as we've been talking about apostasy in the end times. You know, there's a lot you can talk about in regard to the last days and those days before Christ's return. There's a lot of significant prophecy. Of course, they're all significant. But uniquely, this stands out in, uh, because every book of the Bible, it seems, from the Old Testament, New Testament, deals with this issue on some level. And especially as Jude gets into saying, this is, this is what's happening now. This, this apostasy has begun. You need to be aware of what's happening and be on guard for it. In fact, he goes on even further than that. And he says, I want you to contend. And that is a boxing terminology. All right. Put your dukes up. I want you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In other words, he said, there's a message that God has given to man. It's the message of salvation. It's the message of hope. It's the gospel, basically, in a nutshell, that God sent his son to die for the sins of all men because all men are guilty. And that in his death was the price that was sufficient to pay for all men's sin for all time. And there's only one way that you're going to experience the grace of God. And there's only one way you're going to avoid the judgment to come. And there's only one way that you're going to experience the beauty of heaven. And that is this faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a, we said in past sermons here of this, in this series that there's a lot of people who refer to religion as faith, but that's erroneous. There's a lot of religions, but according to the scripture, there's only one faith. And that's the faith that Jude is talking about, this relationship that you can have with God the Father through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. Now that, that message today is somehow being lost in the culture because the world, uh, the wisdom of the world dictates that, hey, well, you know, there's many faiths and there's many ways and they all lead the same path. And, you know, it's just important that you're sincere and on and on it goes. But that's, that's what the Bible is warning against here. This is exactly what he's saying. In the end times, in the last days, that would be popular philosophy. So we need to understand that that is not true, that there are not many ways. So we should earnestly contend for the faith. So in retrospect to everything I've said for those who've been in the series, as I have brought up certain religions and certain denominations, perhaps, or, or certain cults, which may be popular and acceptable today, so much so that some are world leading religions in the guise of Christianity. I'm sure that someone somewhere has thought, Pastor Joe, you're just being too hard. I am earnestly contending for the faith that was once for all delivered. All right, this isn't like Microsoft. There's not version 1.2.011 AB, all right? There's just one version. Anything but that version is a perversion. All right? It's not adequate. It won't, it won't save you. It, it won't change your life. So that, that's why we preach messages like this. So uh, it's never my intent to, to insult somebody's integrity or somebody's uh, religion or anything. My, my, in, my intention is always to affirm and confirm the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ which is, by the way, rejected in the world that we're living in. You know, but they're just more vocal about it than they've ever been before, amen? So as we get in this series, please understand as we talk about things, and even as we would mention some names, the scripture is very clear about that we should contend for the faith, so much so that Paul said, you know, if there's heresy, you mark those who cause that kind of division. He wasn't talking about a little squabble among church members when he said division. He's talking about new heretical ideas being introduced in the body of Christ. And that, that is a hallmark stamp for the last days uh, uh, for the church. That in the last days, these doctrines would come. Doctrines of demons, the scripture says. They would be introduced into the body of Christ. And this is what he's saying. You, when you see those things, stand up against them. When you see people moving towards this uh, everything's acceptable mindset, hey, that's the time that you should contend for the faith, earnestly contend for the faith. Amen? 
You still with me? Say, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Frank's running the PowerPoint back there today, and he's real old, so be patient. <laughs> he's just celebrated his 70th this last week, so y'all give him a little praise the Lord. Amen. I told him the beautiful thing about growing senile is you get to hide your own Easter eggs. So. <laughs> Amen. I'll leave poor Frank alone. Let's look in Scripture. We're looking in the book of Jude. We're looking at verses 12 and 13 specifically today. The, the verses before, we'll, I'm going to re review that in just a moment. But today we're focusing on these two verses in apostasy. The study says, these men are those who are hidden reefs in your love feast. When they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, they're clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, Wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam. Wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. Now again, this is, a, this is a kind of a description of the, the character of the apostates and, and what they're like. Remember, our simple definition for apostasy is an abandonment or rejection of the truth. To be an apostate, you have to know the truth, all right, uh, but not just embrace the truth. To be an apostate, you're someone who's familiar with the truth. You're informed, as we said last week, but not yet transformed. You, you understand the concept of the gospel, so to say, but yet you've never truly committed your heart and your life to follow the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You're not a disciple of Christ. You're familiar with Christianity. You're in the mix. You know, you're in, you're in the fields. You're growing alongside of them, but it's like the wheat and the tare, as Scripture talks about. But when it comes down to the fact of knowing and embracing truth, there is a rejection. Now, the last couple of Sundays, we've been looking at four, four, four marks of the apostate. And the four things that we looked at were these. We talked about, I clicked that one time because I hit the wrong button and you've got to fix it for me. Thank you. All right. Last two Sundays, we dealt with the character and the, co the company uh, the conduct, the company, and the character, and the condemnation. Now, uh, the last couple of weeks has been the conduct and their company. And today, when he talks about these particular elements of their life and the reference to these, the, the, to these uh, phenomena that he talks about here, he's talking about what it is about their character uh, that you need to understand about them. He gives more, a little accurate understanding of who they are. Next week, we'll talk about their condemnation. Last week, in discussing their conduct, we talked about these five elements, and this is, this is kind of just rehearsing what the scripture says. They defile the flesh. In other words, they're marked by immorality. They despise dominion and authority. They reject the lordship of Christ. They speak evil of glories. In other words, when they talk about God and start rejecting the lordship of Christ and who he is, that he's, he is the son of God, equal to God, part of the Trinity, the only hope of salvation, they're, they're blasphemous about that. They reject that. And they, they talk about things they really don't understand. And the things that they do understand, you know, those things they, they're corrupted by. So the idea is, this is first of all their conduct, which leads us to understand the way they, the, why, the reason why they do the things they do, why do they conduct themselves, you know, is, is because of, of the character. Now he identified them with these three characters of the Old Testament. We talked about Cain, and we talked about Balaam, and we talked about Korah. That was the, the, uh, the meat from last week's message, if you weren't here. These three, these three people in history, in biblical history, why do they, uh, why, why are they cataloged with, with the apostates? We talked about Cain and his arrogance and just presenting and bringing to God what he wanted to, to do. It's kind of like, I, I, I'm serving Jesus the way I, I, I want to serve Jesus. It's me and Jesus got our own thing going mindset. That, 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 the idea that's popular today that you can just kind of, you know, uh, it's, it's DIY, do it yourself kind of Christianity. You just kind of put together the way you like it and what's, you know, uh, acceptable for you. And, you know, you reject the things you don't want and you accept the things you do want. It's, it's kind of like going through the, the buffet at the pizza line, you know. You pick out what you want and what you don't want. You know, I like sausage, I like ham, or I like, you know, this or that. But, you know, don't, don't give me those, those green onions or give me gas, so you'll pass those up. And, you know, you just kind of pick and choose the, the things you like or the things you don't like, the things you want, the things you don't want. That's the way people do with Christianity. That's the way of Cain. The way of Balaam was he's just a prophet for hire. All right, it's just about what he can get out of it, what's good for him. And Korah, he just rejected all, any mediator. He didn't need anybody standing between him and God. We need Jesus standing between us and God. Now, in their character, it's interesting the way he lays this out because he uses uh, an illustration of five natural phenomena. He talks about rocks. He talks about clouds. 
He talks about trees. He talks about waves. He talks about stars. And he says, this is the way the apostates are. This is the way they live their life. And this is, this is, this is their character. But he just doesn't say they're like a rock. They're like a cloud. Like a tree. He gets very specific about what kind of rocks and clouds and trees and those kind of things that they are. And he, and he clarifies it so that we know very clearly uh, what it is that, that's driving these apostates and why are they the way that they are, what it is that makes them this way. Now, he starts out by saying they are like hidden, I think King James Version says they are spots within your love feast. All right. Another translation says they're like hidden reefs. Another translation says they are like hidden rocks. Uh, the hidden rocks, these reefs, are, are what cause the multitude of, of shipwrecks in, in the ancient days because the shorelines weren't mapped, the reefs weren't mapped, and there's still wreckage all along reefs all over the world to, to, this, to this very day where ships have gone in, uncharted waters, and everything looks good on the surface, but it's not good, and they hit these rocks and they hit these reefs, and all of a sudden, you, you know, the, the ship sinks and every, everything goes down. But let me, let me just back up to, to a moment about the spot within your love feast. Frank, if you go back to that where it says love feast, because somebody didn't do the, the subtitle on that last one. The love feast that he's talking about here is, is where Paul was talking to the church at Corinth. And remember, he's rebuking them about how they corrupted the Lord's, the Lord's Supper and they, they would have these big fellowships and these big meals. Well, where that whole mindset for love feast came from was that when the first century church, a predominantly Jewish church, you know, they would take communion. They would do it just as Christ did it. They'd have full Passover meal and they'd receive communion at the end of the Passover meal. The Gentiles kind of embraced this, the Gentile church, but it wasn't Passover meal. It was just a big meal and it was called the love feast. And it kind of, it kind of grew out of that and into the thing they called the love feast. It, it's probably the, the origins of the first potluck suppers for churches, you know, where everybody brings food and everybody fellowships around the food and they all eat. Now, obviously what was happening because of the apostates, this meal was being corrupted. It was a good idea in, in a lot of different ways to start with it. This particular mindset of the, the apostates, the love feast, that died right after the first century because of Paul's you know, rejection and of it and what was happening at it because of what was taking place at it. It was a meal. Everybody bring a lot of food. Of course, the rich brought more. The poor, probably the only good meal that the, the, the extremely poor in the church ever got was at these love feasts. But then it was kind of tied in with the Lord's Supper and what was happening at Corinth. You know, the, these people who always considered themselves so highly intelligent, the, the, these people were corrupting it. They were coming in, they were getting drunk. You know, there's immorality going on and Paul was rebuking them. And that's what they, he talks about in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, in giving this instruction, I do not praise you. And he gets to talking about the heresies or the divisions that are in the church. And the word division there had to do with, there was people who were coming into these love feasts and they were kind of using it as a platform to, to spread their, their little idea about how things really ought to be. That kind of happens at a lot of church fellowships, I know. But this is more than just the way, you know, I think what time we ought to start or not start, or what we ought to eat for dinner or not eat for dinner. This got into the issues of theological debate where they'd come in at these, these love feasts and they'd start spreading these erroneous doctrines about grace and about the lordship of Christ and, you know, preaching and teaching all these things. And, and Paul said, you know, these people are coming to these love feasts and they are like hidden rocks, you know. And, and, and like I said, when Paul wrote the church in, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, it was a great rebuke. He says, listen, you, you, you got houses to eat and drink in. You know, you don't need to come up. Don't despise the church of God. When we come together for communion, we ought to remember it's a time we come with pure hearts and pure minds and our sins are confessed and that we're genuinely right with the Lord Jesus Christ. But the apostates, They'd come to these love feasts and, and they were provoking all kinds of ungodliness, spreading all kinds of erroneous doctrine and immorality as well because they're always marked by, by immorality. He said they're like hidden rocks. Paul wrote the church to, to, to Timothy and he wrote to them about how people make their lives shipwreck. Well, they shipwreck on these hidden reefs. He says, how do they do this? He says, you should hold the faith and a good conscience. Because some have thrust from these things from them and made shipwreck concerning the faith of whom Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered into Satan, that they might be taught not to blaspheme. So there's two guys who are apostates. And he mentions names, by the way, for people who say that's not really spiritual. You shouldn't mention names. Just read your Bible a little bit and you'll see a lot of names are mentioned like we saw here with Jude mentioning a whole bunch of names, doesn't he? Paul mentions names. The scripture has a lot of so-called marking people because of what they were teaching. 
So if you come into Believer's Fellowship and you come in with some erroneous doctrine, you know, and you don't, you're not willing to get it right, then Brother Joe will just be calling your name on Sunday. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Amen. Teaching lies. He said I, they need to be taught not to speak against God was the word blasting there because God has already spoken. So anybody that comes in with some kind of new doctrine that's contrary to the old doctrine, that is blasphemous. It's against God because God's word is settled forever, the Bible says. God's not changing his mind. I spoke to you a few weeks ago about open theism where, you know, that's a, a theology that people believe that God's still kind of working it out. And he's still changing his mind about things. And so, you know, I know God said homosexual was wrong in the Old Testament, New Testament. You know, he's still, he's, you know, he's progressing like us. <laughs> That's supposed to be humorous. <laughs> We're doing anything but progressing, all right? We're living constantly in regression. We, we're so regressed, we think that the federal government should be setting our standards for living by you know, what is moral and what's acceptable and what's not sin and what is sin and what we should embrace and what we shouldn't embrace. He said, these apostates are like that. They're like kid and rocks. And you just, you know, if you abandon the faith and a good conscience and you start listening to these people, you're gonna, you, you'll be shipwrecked yourself. He said, they come in and he says, while they're at the love feast, he says, they feast without fear. In other words, there's just no fear of God. They don't even care that their actions, their teachings, what they're going to do creates terrible problems and terrible crises and great damage to people's hearts and homes and lives because they don't care about other people. They're, they're like spiritual narcissists. It's all about me. What about me? What can I get? What's good for me? What do I want? And how is this going to help me? I really don't care about you. And, and they enter with that same kind of attitude with no fear of God. You know, they just, they have no respect for God, no respect for God's word. They just do what they want to do. You know, while those love feasts were initially designed for, for believers to care for one another, to be an encouragement to one another, to, to help one another, to lift one another up, they made them a platform, you know, for promoting their agendas. That's the way I think things ought to go. And they're just guilty of caring for themselves and no one else. In fact, he uses those words, they care for themselves. And by the way, that's that Greek word poimano, which is the word we get, we get from the Greek language and we translate in the Bible to the word shepherd or to the word pastor. In other words, he says, they don't care about anybody else. They're not interested in helping other people. They're not interested in ministering to people encouraging people, edifying people. They're just there for themselves and that's it. You know, what, what am I going to get out of this and how can I make this situation benefit me? Hey, it's going to be a love feast. You know, Baptist and Biscuits, they always show up for food. So everybody's going to be there. That was humorous too. Go ahead and chuck a little bit if you like. Y'all are really slow this morning. I'm going to slow down a whole lot, okay, just for you. They don't care that what other people's hearts are how it might affect them or how it might affect the whole of the vision or the passion of the body. They're just there to do one thing and that is shepherd themselves. In fact, the, the English Standard Version goes back and it says, you know, that they're just shepherds feeding themselves. Second Corinthians, Paul talked about these people and he said, why are you putting up with this? He said, you bear with anyone and they enslave you. They devour you. If they take advantage of you, if you exalt them, hey, he still just hits you in the face. I think English Standard Version, they, just, they, they turn around you keep exalting them. They don't care about you. They don't care about themselves. And they, they might even smack you in the face and you still put up with them. He said, they're apostates. They're false teachers. Boy, I have never seen anything like that until the day and the age that we live in. We have so many people who have such public ministries in our culture who have such immoral lifestyles been placed before people and people just bear with it and they just put up with it and they don't care, you know, because everybody else is doing it. I mean, they turn around and their immorality is a smack in the face of God and a smack in the holiness of the church. And still they're, they're able to continue whatever they've been doing all along. And people just put up. That's where Paul was rebuked. What are you putting up with this for? You know, they don't care about you. They're not interested in you or they're not interested in your life. They just only want what they want. And that's all that's important for them. You bear with anyone if he enslaves you. These selfish, self-caring, self-exalting shepherds, you know, they do it without fear. In other words, they're an arrogant lot. It's a lot of pride in their life. In fact, that's the difference between the, the true shepherd and what Jesus called the hireling. The hireling, when problems come, when it's going to cost them something, when sacrifices them up, they'll leave. The true shepherd will stick it out no matter how many wolves keep coming. He'll still stand and he'll fight for the flock to protect the flock. 
No matter what it costs, he's going to hang in there and be faithful to God and faithful to the word of God. We have whole churches that are filled with pastors like this across this nation. They're real, I mean, there, yes, there are many godly churches and many godly pastors, but at the same time, what the Bible prophesied has come true. We have many churches that are led by apostate pastors. They don't claim the, the inerrancy of Scripture anymore. They don't embrace holiness. They don't embrace the, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. They're there to make you feel good, tickle your ears, tell you what you want to hear, and collect your money. And they'll say to you whatever it takes for you to give to them whatever they're trying to get from you. It's acceptable. It's popular. And here's the thing about it. The pastor's not only guilty. The people are equally guilty. Because we not only have apostate leaders, we have apostate, apostate members as well. All right? And, and the apostate member lives like this. Make me feel better today. Give me something. Make me feel special. You know, do something for me. What am I going to get out of this? What can you give to me? How's this going to benefit me? And if this doesn't help me, benefit me or give me something, you know, I'm not interested. And then I'll find some place where they'll tell me what I want to hear. Give me what I want to give me what I want to get. And that's the culture, is it not? It's not that's why church shopping's become such a, a favorite but among so many today. Let's go see what, who's got the best program for me and for mine and you know, what, what they're going to do for me. We've lost the mindset. What can I do for the kingdom? I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. I, I didn't come to get. I came to give. I, I'm here for the glory of God. I'm here on a mission. I'm here with a passion. I'm here with a commitment. I, I'm, it's not about us. It's about God's glory and God's kingdom and God's work and God's church. That mindset is lost in the world that we live in because of these selfish shepherds. Ezekiel talks about him in, in chapter 34, verse 2, when he says, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? But not these guys, because they're only interested in themselves. So he, he refers to them, first of all, as rocks. The second reference he gives to them, he calls them clouds without water carried along by the winds. Now, clouds without water is something we're pretty familiar with in Texas these days because of the long extended droughts that we keep experiencing. All right. It's a picture of, uh, of a drought season with big cumulus clouds rolling in. And there's this expectation for rain and nothing happens. Boy, you know, I, I, I tell you, the attitude when you're in drought certainly changes about cloud. I mean, we've had some rains off and on for the last you know, couple of months now. Praise the Lord. And it, you know, when there's been a lot of rain, you hear people say, I can't believe it's raining again today. But when there's been no rain, you know, and people walk out and they see clouds and there's this expectation. They, they're saying, come on, rain, you know, please rain today. And, and nobody complains. It's raining today. Ain't it great? <laughs> but when you're in drought, and there's hunger and there's expectation. I mean, even where I live, I'm, I walk out on the porch on some of these cloudy days. And you say, oh, it's going to rain. It starts getting dark even. And the wind blows a little bit and nothing happens. He says, that's the way these apostates are. They billow up and look like something's getting ready to happen and some great blessing is going to come and nothing you get, you get nothing out of them. There's no rain. So all your expectations and all your hope for longing for seeing some fresh rainfall, it just doesn't happen. Proverbs puts a word out that's very clear on this. It says, whoever boasts himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. The ESV version says, like clouds and winds without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he doesn't give. And he says these, these little apostate preachers and teachers and leaders, they, they present themselves as a man of great gifts, a person with a great, you know, something to offer, but they're not interested in the issue. You're not going to get anything from them because it's really all about how is this going to benefit me? Great gifts to offer, but nothing's ever given. He said, that's, that's, that's the character of these people. They're like clouds without water carried along with wind, you know. That same phrase, by the way, without water, is the same phrase used in Matthew when Jesus is speaking about demons. You know, the story where the, where the, the hogs, you know, and, and all that about they will be cast out because he's made reference in Matthew 12 to about these spirits uh, that speaks of dry places in which the, the spirits abound and, and they don't want to be there. They, the demons want to inhabit people. They want to control situations. They, they want to overrule the kingdom of God and the work of God and God's creation. All right. 
And he refers that without water is the same terminology he's referencing. Basically, he's kind of putting the, not kind of, he is putting the apostate era and the apostate doctrine and the apostate leadership in the same category with rebellious spirits. But that shouldn't be anything new. We saw that before. Two weeks ago, we talked about how they're like the angels who left their first estate. They didn't want to submit to the will of God, so they leave what they're supposed to be doing and they go other places. And he said, that's, that's without water. It's miserable places where the spirits abound. Uh, carried with the wind refers to, in Scripture, literally, uh, the, the control of demonic forces. The Bible talks about in the last days how people would be you know, carried along by every wind of doctrine. That means every little doctrine that comes along that's not of God, it's just wind. It's not going to bring any satisfaction. So there is this connection between the apostate world and the demonic world. He says they're carried, they're without water and they're carried by wind. But this terminology of carried by wind means literally whatever's happening, they, they, they just kind of go to that. It's whatever's spiritually vogue. Now, I've been saved now like 104 years. I know I look good from age. This is my 40th year of ministry. All right. I got saved when I was one and a half. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if that's encouragement or what it is, but I'll take it. 40 years of ministry. I don't have enough paper and pen to write down how many different doctrines have been introduced during that time that weren't biblical. But I mean, it's been one movement after another movement. I mean, we've had more movements in Christianity than x lax has ever stopped. All right. So it's or started. It's, it's just been one thing, and that's a good, by the way, a good connection there, by the way, in case you think not. <laughs> According to what the Bible says, it is dung. It's refuge. It's garbage. It sounds good, but it's not good. It sounds Christian, but it's not Christian. I mean, there's been so many things that have been taken out of Scripture and perverted, like the prosperity doctrine. God wants everybody rich, you know. That's a favorite message of the apostates. Paul said, we watch out for those people who suppose that gain is godliness, Learn to be content with what, I, what God gives you, amen? So you have that whole process. And, and then they take another doctrine like healing. That, oh, God heals. Well, yes, God does bless, and God does bless our giving, but it doesn't say God wants to make you rich. It says God wants to, for you to be prosperous, and prospering, according to Scripture, means God wants to meet your needs so that you have your needs met, and so much so that you have enough to help other people along the journey. That's true prosperity. That I can, I'm blessed, and I can be a blessing. All right. So if God makes me rich in doing that. That's God's business. My business is to be obedient to God. But then that, that whole issue of healing, you know, what God heals. We've seen God heal in our church. We've seen healings. You know, I've experienced healing in my own life. Some of you have. But it doesn't mean that God heals every Christian in every time in every situation. The Bible doesn't teach that. But it's vogue and it's acceptable and it's popular. So let's do that because, hey, I can tell you, listen, if you'll write me a hundred dollar check to me, Joe Arms today, hey, God's going to bless you real big. In fact, I'll pray the hundredfold blessing over it. <laughs> you ever heard that one? I, I hear that one on you know, the, the Too Bad Network, TBN. The uh, <laughs> personal opinion. Uh, you know, the guy says, oh, now, everybody, we're, we're going to stop taking these calls. Just hurry now. Get on the phone because you don't want to miss your blessing. Like God's only going to bless you in the context next 20 minutes. After that, <laughs> you're too late. But if you can do it in the next 20 minutes while God's still working because I'm here. That's the way it usually always plays. Great gifts. It's me. I got a lot to offer. God, you know, send that gift right now and I'll pray. And this is what was the hundredfold blessing. Now, what if I send it five minutes late? Can I at least get a fivefold blessing? <laughs> Some kind of blessing. It's just ridiculous the stuff that Christians believe and embrace and promote, you know, by people who don't care about them most of the time, only interested in milking this flock and shearing the sheep for their own benefit they carried. And, and Deuteronomy 32, too, it says, My doctrine, God's doctrine, he says, My doctrine, though, shall drop as rain and snow from heaven. All right, go back up to that for me if you would, don't mind. My doctrine will drop as rain. My speech shall distill as the dew. When God says, in other words, when I come on the scene, I give rain. When I meet the need. If you're looking to me with hope, it is a sure hope. It is not empty hope. 
If you're looking at me with some expectation, you, I can be trusted. I do not lie. What I say I will perform, I will perform. What I say I will do, that I will do. So the scriptures teach that, hey, God's a God, you know, who's go, whose word is going to be like rain, who's, whose ways are going to be like refreshing. Isaiah 55, 10, Isaiah is comparing the, girl, the word of God not only to rain and not only to the blessings of rain, but he also talks about snow from heaven that brings about fruit on the earth. That's the word of God in contrast to the word of the apostates. In verse 12, he uses the third illustration. He talks about autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. New, American, New English version says this. He says, these are trees in season that bear no fruit. Some say dead trees. Some say autumn trees. Some say autumn trees without fruit. The idea here is, is that it's late autumn and there's no fruit. It should have been fruit back in, you know, in, in the fruit bearing season. It's, it's come and it's gone. And you look like you're supposed to bear fruit, but you don't bear fruit. It's just not there. It's, it's, it, it should be there. I mean, even in the Christian life, in the context of the trees and the fruit, we are trees that should bear fruit. We are plants in the household of God, the scripture said. And that, that Jesus said, one thing about my disciples, you'll know my disciples by their fruit. Jesus turned to his disciples and said, listen, you want to glorify our Father in heaven? He said, Here's, here is how you glorify God. Bear much fruit. Therein is my Father glorified. Bear fruit. And what is that fruit? Well, it's the fruit of Christ-likeness. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In our life, it's the fruit of love and kindness and meekness and joy and temperance and, and self control that, That's fruit of the Spirit. But also others, you know, it, we produce, in Genesis it says, after each kind produced after its own kind. Every Christian should be bearing fruit of more Christians. They're bringing people to Christ as well. That's how we know we're saved because Christ flows from our life and if Christ flows from our life, then lives are changed around us. We're bringing people to know Jesus Christ. That, that is fruit bearing. But in Matthew 13, when Jesus gave the parable of the wheat and the tare, you remember the story there that, that says that the, that, the, that the wheat grew alongside the tare. The tare was the weeds. It wasn't the real thing. And you've heard me preach on this before, that the difference between the weed and the wheat is that the weed, or the tare, doesn't produce a grain. It looks just like wheat. I had a farmer in the panhandle tell me, uh, after preaching on Matthew 13 one time, he said, you know, he said, we have a name for that out here. He said, we call it cheat grass. He said, some of my farmer friends that aren't saved have a different name for it. He said, but we call it cheat grass because it looks like it's going to come up. Remember one illustration when Jesus was teaching on, the, on this parable, he went a little later and he says, he, he told the parable about how the enemy came in at night and sowed the tare amongst the wheat. And the, and the, the farmer said, well, you know, well, shall I go uproot it? He says, no, you know, you, you may not know the difference. Wait for the, for the judgment. The angels will separate the wheat from the tare. Why? Because the tare looks so much like wheat in the growing process, you can't tell the difference. It's not till it comes to this point of bearing fruit. It's not till it comes to this point of basically having a, a head, you know, a grain stalk on it. That's when you begin to realize that, that it's not real or that it is real. And he's saying here, these, these are twice dead trees. They they're, they're, should be uprooted. There's a verse in Genesis 1 that, that talks about in creation, about how that within the context of creation, that God placed within every tree, said, let it, that the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. In other words, God created a tree to bear fruit. And when it bore the fruit, inside the fruit would be the seed. All right. It's the same for us. When the word of God is birthed and we're birthed by the word of God, he gives us this new life in Christ and with it comes the capacity to bring forth more fruit. All right. But the apostate's not like that. He said they're doubly dead. They have no fruit. And when you follow it on through, he said not only do they have no fruit, they're twice dead. They're doubly dead. Why? Because they, they, they back up and go down there for them. Because not only do they have no fruit, here's the real problem. They've got no root. All right. There's no fruit, there's no root. And when there's no fruit, it's usually because there's no real root. The problem is, that's why he calls them doubly dead, plucked up by the roots. Remember the parable in Matthew when he says, he answers that every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. It's going to be brought up. 
That's why the guy says, you know, I'll take care of the separation process, but you just need to be on guard not to identify, not to embrace, not to receive, and not to believe these kind of people who fit this kind of frame. The fourth is this, and we'll hurry with this. The fourth is just the wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam. Now, I don't know about, I love the sea. I love everything. I'm a, I'm a water person, all right? But I especially love the ocean and the sea. You know, it's just something powerful. If you, you, you stand on the, the, the seawall in any place where the water comes crashing in, it's, it's big, it's powerful, it's beautiful. He's not saying that the apostates are big and powerful and beautiful. He gives a little clearer rendition with this when he said they are like wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam. Isaiah 57, 20 says, the wicked are like the troubled sea. This is different, all right? He's not making a reference to, to the, the beauty and the, 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 the power of, of the ocean in this regard. He's talking about a storm brewing. He's talking about troublesome seas, raging waves as Jude calls it here. Not because of their power, but because of their pride, because of their arrogant speech. This arrogance that they have, this boisterous speech. He said their mouth in verse 16 speaketh great swelling words like the swelling of the sea. They, they make a lot of noise. They clamor a lot, but they don't produce anything of value. It's like shameful foam being spewed out. Have you ever been down and walked on the beach after, after it's been a real big storm? It's not filled with roses, is it? It's trash, it's filth, it's foam, all gathered up on the beach. You know, you got to watch where you step. He said, that's what the apostates are like, and that's what they produce. They're like wild waves spewing out foam. And he says, they're also like wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. Now, well, this wandering star, he's not talking about the children of God, which are called, you know, like the brightness of the stars. And he's not talking about the morning glory star of Jesus Christ. He's talking about wandering stars. Well, what's that mean? Well, if you're an astronomy at all, you know that stars don't wander, okay? Stars are fixed. You can, you can navigate by them. Ancient ships navigated by, by the stars. They'd get their fix, they'd set their compass up, and they would go the direction because stars were reliable sources of navigation. But wandering stars are not. What he's referring to, they're like the shooting stars. The little flash in the night. You've been sitting on the back porch at night, and you say, oh, a shooting star. He said, that's what apostates are. <laughs> they're bright for a moment, flash in the pan, in and out, in, out of darkness, back into darkness. They appear just for a while. They're not going to last. They're not eternal. And they will always lead you astray. If you try to set and navigate yourself on them, then they're going to lead you amiss every time. Because stars will move in fixed orbits. Stars don't black out. This refers to, 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 to the apostate and how he just kind of looks good, but it's only for the moment. You're kind of reminded, you know, as you go through this process about these stars, out all contrast to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Frank, if you'll go down one as I time as I'll talk about it. First of all, they are the hidden rocks, but who is Jesus? He is the solid rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Christ is the solid. Jesus said, you know, if any man builds his house on my word. Remember, he's using the parable of the, the rock and the sand. If you build your house on sand, it's going to sink. You build your house on the rock, it's going to be established. For you who choose to commit your heart, your life, your soul, your, your, your destiny to Christ Jesus, you have built on a solid foundation. It is fixed. It is secure. The winds will come. Trials will come. Difficulties will come. Storms will come. Floods will come. Hey, but it's not going to destroy your life. If you build on sand, you have no hope. So he is like the rock. Now, he also comes. The Bible makes a reference to God and to his clouds and reference to his glory. But his clouds and the scripture said are like his word that refresh his people. The apostates bloom up as big clouds. They don't offer anything. There's even the reference to the end times of Jesus coming with clouds. It's talking about the glory of God, this great revelation. I, I'm always amazed, you know, when I, if I'm looking for something to watch on TV and I'll be flipping through and my TV has a little description, you know, what the show's all about. It'll say something like that. This movie or this show is a, it has an apocalyptic setting. And of course, what they mean is kind of like a post-nuclear war zone, you know, and people are wandering around and there's no power, there's no energy, there's no nothing, you know, and that's called an apocalypse. Listen, that's not the apocalypse I know about. 
You know what apocalyptic means? You know, it means Jesus is coming. The apocalypse is a word which means the revelation, the unfolding, the full disclosure of Jesus Christ in all his glory. That's the apocalypse I'm looking for. I'm not afraid. I'm excited about the coming apocalypse, the coming revelation, the full revelation of Jesus Christ in all his glory when his foot sits down on the Mount of Olives. Amen. What a day that's going to be. So we're, you know, when we talk about apostasy, some of this stuff looks discouraging. You know, man, it looks like the homosexuals are taking over the world. <laughs> You can't say anything because you're a mean person, you know, and you've got to just accept everybody's faith as, as, as equal to your faith. The Bible doesn't say we do that. That's what the government says. All right. So don't be, don't be in despair. He, he's talking about right before Jesus comes. He's talking about the moment of the apostle. He's talking about the moment. Wouldn't be excited. He said, we don't have to worry. We've got the true clouds of God's word and his glory. But he goes on that and, and he talks about the trees, these twice dead trees. But you look to Jesus, who's the ultimate and absolute tree of life. And we don't have time to get in that direction. But that's, there's a great difference where the troubled seas and what does Jesus do? He leads us beside still waters for his namesake. Man, what a great God we serve. You talk about wandering stars. The scripture describes him as the bright, the glorious morning star. And we as children will shine bright as the stars. So isn't it amazing how Satan's always seeking to counterfeit, counterfeit, make an artificial version of the true thing. Listen, I know as, as a believer sometimes it gets discouraging. And we see the apostate and his action. And, and we begin to realize what's happening in the church and the world. We see so many churches that become so, you know, so liberal in their, their approach to scripture, rejection of truth, rejection of the lordship of Christ. Mainline preachers standing up and saying, you know, this open theism theology. Mainline preachers kind of saying, well, everybody's going to be in heaven. And it just you think, what in the world is going on? The Bible is going on just like God said it would. It's going on. So we have every reason to be excited. We have every reason to have hope. We, hey, we're, we're not losers here. We're the victors, not the victims. We're the overcomers. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So don't, don't lose heart. Let, let, me, let me just give you a, a last quote that I took out of John MacArthur's uh, commentary on the on, on New Testament, on, on, on the book of Jude. He says this, false teachers are hypocritical deceivers, immoral sinners, materialistic hedonists, and as a result, spiritual terrorists. They misrepresent the truth about the gospel of Christ. They twist the teaching of scripture. And in contrast, true shepherds have an accurate understanding of the gospel and a right view of who Jesus is. And they possess a humble, submissive attitude towards Christ's lordship. And they understand the seriousness of the Lord's declaration when he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. What a great quote, because that is all of what we've just said in the last few weeks in a nutshell, in description of these people versus the reality of what is true and what is right. Don't be moved. Don't be pushed aside. Don't, don't compromise what you know to be the truth of God's word, because everybody in the culture is going a different direction. That's exactly what the Bible says. There's two roads with many on it. One crowded, everybody thinks they're right, but it's heading the wrong direction. The other road with a few on it, and its end is in heaven. Embrace the truth, no matter what everybody else at work is doing, no matter what everybody else at school is doing, no matter what everybody in the nation's doing, be true. Embrace Christ, embrace the cross, embrace the gospel. Don't give up for anything. Keep pressing on. That's the mark of the true saint of God. So many people will not do that because they're looking for an excuse to somehow have some kind of religious little flowering thing about their life so they look good and their conscience is somehow satisfied but yet still walk in darkness. Be what God's called you to be. Be faithful to Christ. Any man will come after me. Let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. Follow Jesus. Would you stand with your heads bowed?